can uh, get started about now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the July edition of the um, UCAN Plus Underwater Acoustics Special Interest Group's uh, monthly webinar. Today, we've got with us Catherine Tate from EMEC, and she's got a presentation to give us about uh, acoustic monitoring at the European Marine Energy Center. We'll be getting into that in a minute. Uh, we'll be letting her do a presentation and then open up for uh, questions and answers afterwards. Um, just before I get into this, I just want to mention a event that us at UCAN Plus uh, in the Underwater Acoustics Group have uh, been preparing. This is the Underwater Acoustics Data Challenge Workshop that we'll be undertaking in uh, September over in uh, near Bath and Guy's house. Um, there's more information about this on the website and see the uh, you can see the link down there on the screen. Um, feel free to click on that and have a look uh, if you're interested. But for now, uh, I think we're ready to pass it over to Catherine. If she'd be happy to um, share her screen and we can uh, get started with the webinar. Brilliant, thank you very much. I will just find the screen. Can you confirm, Ben, that, that you can see that? Yes, thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks, Ben. And thanks everyone for joining uh, today. I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the European Marine Energy Centre, uh, talking a little bit about the acoustic monitoring that we do. Uh, I work as an environmental officer at EMEC and I'm responsible for sort of implementing planning environmental monitoring around wave and tidal energy devices that are put on at our site and my background is in marine biology. So we've got a bit more time today, um, so it's just me, so I'm going to take some time to talk about uh, an overview of EMEC and what we do and uh, introduce the concept of environmental monitoring in the context of marine renewable energy. I'll then talk about the main part of my presentation today, which is how we characterize the acoustic signature of uh, marine renewable energy devices. I'll talk a little bit about how acoustics can inform collision risk and then finish up with a summary and forward look. So to introduce um, EMEC, uh, we are based in Orkney, which is off the north tip of Scotland. It is an open sea performance test centre for marine renewable energy technologies. The company was established in 2003 and since then has received uh, 39 million of public funding. And due to the activity on site over that time, we have been self-funded since 2011. Currently, it's the only IEC accredited marine energy test centre in the world, IEC standing for the International Electrotechnical Commission. And due to the nature of wave and tidal energy devices uh, extracting from natural resource, we're often, well, we are operating in dynamic marine environments. So we have four offshore test sites for developers to come out and uh, demonstrate their technologies. So we've got two full scale uh, grid connected sites for uh, wave and tidal devices each. So our wave site is at Billy Crew and the tidal site is called Fall of Warness. And these both benefit from strong natural resource. So for example, the wave test site at Billy Crew uh, the significant wave height averages around two to three metres, whereas in winter conditions it can uh, peak up to eight to ten metres. Whereas the grid connected uh, tidal test site, the tidal current stream can be up to a maximum of around four metres per second, so it really is strong currents in this tidal channel. But we do have two smaller scale te uh, test sites, which uh, again, both wave and tidal. And these offer more benign conditions for uh, developers to try out smaller scale devices on our sites. So we've been operating for 20 years now. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of ocean energy projects. So in terms of developers coming onto our site to demonstrate their technologies, we've been involved in assisting technology development and testing the reliability of different technologies. We've been involved in environmental data collection, uh, as well as certification of uh, devices through power performance assessment, as well as looking into diversi diversification in terms of how we can contribute to the energy mix through different ways of combining technologies. 
but I'm going to focus on environmental monitoring in the context of marine renewable energy. Um, when we think of marine renewables as an industry, it's a lot younger than other offshore industries. So one of the biggest barriers to commercialization uh, in this industry is the scientific uncertainty around the environmental impacts of marine renewables. So if we think of the types of impacts we could be dealing with, it is such as <coughs> uh, physical interaction with devices, um, so collision risk, things like that. We could be looking at emissions from the devices themselves, and this includes underwater sound. Or we could also be looking at different types of changes to habitats or oceanographic regimes due to the energy extraction by the devices themselves. So this uncertainty creates a regulatory challenge. Uh, one of the key things that we do at EMEC is consent uh, support. So we are helping developers get their devices in the water through a consenting process with the Scottish regulator Marine Scotland. So when we're doing environmental assessments and we're looking at whether there may be a potential interaction with uh, protected species and habitats, uh, if there is an interaction identified, then this can relate uh, result in uh, scrutiny in the consenting process. And this can lead to uh, environmental monitoring and mitigation conditions um, to be put on as part of your license as well. But to be able to uh, eliminate uncertainty would help us to retire risks as well. And what I mean by that is being able to streamline the consenting process for single and small numbers of devices by building an evidence base that allows us to better identify the level of risk for each of these potential impacts. And this feeds into something called adaptive management, where through the environmental monitoring, the data collection and learnings we're gathering, we're feeding that back into future plans and allowing us to propose more proportionate monitoring and mitigation strategies going forward. And due to our offshore test sites and um, 20 years of operation, we've got an advantage in that we've got a good baseline knowledge of site characteristics. We understand what wildlife receptors present across our sites and how they use the sites as well in terms of seasonality. And with the access to different device types, um, developers bringing uh, iterations of seabed mounted technologies versus floating technologies, this gives us a chance to understand how uh, different devices affect uh, or have uh, interactions with the environment. So it is an ideal uh, situation for environmental monitoring. So what do we use acoustics for at EMIC? Well, the two main things are uh, firstly device acoustic characterization. So this is characterizing the noise signature of the device. Um, and this can help us in planning upscaling arrays and um, looking at new sites for development. Also, in terms of ecological monitoring, uh, one of our biggest interests just now is around fine scale device and marine animal interactions. And this can help us inform collision risk, which I will talk about a bit later. So I'll start with device acoustic characterization to introduce, introduce the topic. Uh, the acoustic output of devices is influenced by a range of factors. So, for example, device type, you could be looking at uh, different um, mechanics associated with the devices, uh, device as well as uh, electrical systems inside. This can all have an impact on the uh, sounds generated by it, but it's also influenced by hydrodynamic conditions. So if we're considering you know, current flow or a high wave activity, this will have an influence as well as the bathymetry of a site. Um, we use hydrophone deployments uh, to capture the noise and we plan our deployments based on the conditions we're going to be working in. So, for example, if it's low current flow, uh, we tend to use a static or a mobile deployment versus high flow. Uh, strong currents, we would use uh, drifting measurements. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The goal of characterizing acoustic uh, output is to be able to capture the range of power production modes uh, from a device. So from 0% rated capacity up to its full operating potential. Um, and that's the ideal sense. And then also for the range of environmental conditions as well. So for example, capturing across the full tidal cycle. And we use uh, the IEC technical specifications 62600-40 as a guiding framework on how to uh, set up uh, methodologies and the data processing results uh, right to the reporting of these uh, surveys. 
and I'll talk a bit about more about the IC-40, which is what we colloquial, uh, colloquially refer to it as. Um, so it, this is the first iteration of this document and it is being developed from international consensus. Just to very briefly summarise the table on the side there, it's comparing uh, wave energy converters versus guidance for current energy converters. So this can be uh, open sea or in a river as well. <coughs> Excuse me. It talks about the frequency limits uh, that you should be basing your uh, studies in. So from 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz. And this encompasses the frequencies of interest uh, that a device may put out that may be audible to aquatic life. It talks about uh, the measurement platform, so fixed versus drifting. I'll talk about more of those in a minute. And then it gives guidance for a spatial and temporal extent. And you can see there they're split by level A and level B. And this uh, guidance is for two different uh, levels of detail for describing these sort of characteristics. The reason that it's been provided is uh, appropriate to different stages of development. For example, level A is more detailed, so it may be more appropriate if you're trying to characterize the acoustic signature of a device that's uh, further along in its commercial development, or perhaps you're looking at sort of array scale at that point. Level B is much reduced detail and it would be more appropriate for, for example, first commerce in the industry or people that are bringing their devices to site for first time and they're just wanting to sort of get a, a snapshot picture of the acoustic output of their devices. So I'm going to talk about the measurement platforms in detail now, starting with drifting surveys. So drifting deployments, as in the name, they are unconstrained in response to external forcing. So uh, we use them at our Fall of Warness current site. Uh, due to the strong currents, they are uh, put into the water and drift uh, unassisted uh, in the, the survey. And the advantages of doing it this way is that it minimizes relative motion between the hydrophone and surrounding water, reducing something that's a common challenge to our industry, which is the flow noise contamination. And this is the, the, the noise that uh, from this current activity that may mask signals of interest uh, potentially coming from the device. So, for example, it's like uh, if you're standing outside trying to talk into a microphone over a windy day and you'll just get the sort of feedback from the wind. Uh, so that is a challenge that we need to try and overcome. The disadvantages of these drifting surveys is uh, because they're moving, they can't uh, collect long term data at a single location. Uh, due to the design of the platforms, if there happens to be any uh, metal to metal contact or something like that, it can produce acoustic self noise, which is still a form of contamination to your desired recordings. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's hard to completely eliminate flow noise. So that is still an issue. The trajectory can't be controlled for these devices because they're unassisted. So this requires personnel to be uh, vigilant throughout the whole survey when we are doing these drifting surveys. So I've just shown two examples on the side there of uh, types of uh, drifting platforms. Uh, the first example above uh, is Emacs version, uh, which we call the drifting acoustic resort uh, recorder or tracker, uh, or we call it as DART for short. And at the top of the, the surface, you'll have the floating uh, buoy as well as a float and a flag and GPS unit for visibility and to be able to track its movements. And then it's connected into the water to the hydrophone recorder, which is protected by a drogue, which reduces some of that flow noise uh, influence. On the far side there, we have a version from the University of Washington, um, which is the Drifting Acoustic Instrumentation System or DAISY for short. You can see they've got a slightly different version where they've combined both surface expression elements into one unit and it's connected down to a flow shield, which is a slightly different approach to uh, preventing that flow noise contamination. So when you're doing a drifting survey per the IEC-40 uh, guidance, you should have your current energy converter and four sampling boxes, which are about 25 metres squared. They should be upstream, downstream, port and starboard of your device. And the way this works is that uh, if you have your marine energy converter and 100 metres away at minimum, 
you have your sample box. You would be upstream of that sample zone, um, opposite the direction of the prevailing current, and the vessel will deploy this uh, drifting system. And in our case, we do it a good few hundred metres away to make sure that the, the drogue, which has a ballast in it, is sort of settled into the right uh, depth in the water column by the time it passes the sample zone. And when you're putting the uh, dart into the water, you make sure that you're switching off the vessel and its engines, any sort of acoustic equipment on board that may interfere with the recording of the hydrophone. And then once it's past the sample zone, you then you know, uh, switch on the boat again, go retrieve it. Then you're repeating this measurement again through the sample box to get a good um, few passes through it to make sure that you've got um, sufficient recordings for that area. So I'm going to show a video of what this looks like in action now. I think it could be a bit laggy, but hopefully you'll be able to see the small red floating buoy that's moving along in the current. And this is in front of the orbital O2 tidal turbine, which for context is about 74 metres long. So it only takes a few minutes for the dart to pass it, and then we have to be vigilant, make sure we retrieve it quickly so we can redeploy it again. And in terms of um, EMEX protocols, we're, we're always looking to sort of improve and develop our systems. And this includes the equipment that we're working with. So in terms of our own DART, we are looking to develop it a bit further. So you've seen an example of the current system and particularly with this drogue, it's quite a large piece of kit. You can see me standing next to it um, on, on land there. But when it's wet in the water, fully saturated, it can be quite cumbersome to handle and retrieve back onto the boat. And we're also using a, a type of acoustic recorder and hydrophone, a very compact system called the Soundtrack, which tends to get a bit lost inside of the, the, the mass of that drogue there. So we're looking to build a, a more streamlined version of the DART for our, for our future acoustic surveys. And this will involve combining those two surface floating expressions into one, um, having it handleable for easier recovery um, having the same flag and lights and while we do have GPS um, recording the movements, we would be looking to try and implement a real-time GPS which will allow us to better track it in as, as it's going along. If we need to uh, retrieve it for any reason, it's not gone through the sample box and we can do so. And then also improving the flow shield. So again, I've mentioned about having that bigger drogue, making it a bit more streamlined and handleable. So on the different side of things, we've got the fixed surveys. Um, this is a type of deployment platform, which is again, in the name, fixed in place. The advantage of this is that it's good for long-term recordings. So it's good for your temporal uh, data. The disadvantage again, is that because it's stationary in the water column, there is that potential for that flow noise contamination, depending on the conditions um, to occur. There's also the potential for increased uh, self noise due to the way that these moorings are often uh, deployed. We, we try and minimize as far as possible any potential sources of mooring chain noise or shackles um, using ropes and things like that. And this is a very basic example of what we might use to deploy our fixed hydrophone platform. So we've got the hydrophone suspended at a certain height in the water column. Um, so far enough from the seabed so that there's no reflections um, from the seabed. Uh, then we have it attached to a small chain clump, attached to a larger chain clump, and uh, the recovery buoy is what will be picked up for visibility. And that's how we would deploy and retrieve the equipment. So in terms of uh, what we need to do our noise characterizations, firstly, we need calibrated equipment. So we can uh, either send our sound traps for a complete calibration every 12 to 24 months um, at an accredited facility, or uh, on, if we are unable to do that, then we also have what is known as a piston phone, which allows for in situ calibration checks of your equipment. That's shown in the picture there. You also need uh, contextual information to be able to help uh, interpret your acoustic data at the other end. 
So the first and most important potentially is understanding what the met ocean resource and the power production conditions are. So what I mean by that is understanding uh, the, the wind conditions on the day, the uh, wave, the uh, current conditions, as well as at what percentage of its rated capacity was a marine energy device operating. So was it at half of its capacity or was it full tide and it was rate, uh, operating 100% because that will influence the, the final acoustic uh, recordings. In terms of Met Ocean and Resource, EMEC has acoustic Doppler current profilers and a wave rider boy equipment that we use when we're doing these kind of surveys to retrieve that data and help us um, match up to our acoustic recordings. And when we're trying to identify uh, marine acoustic signal, uh, excuse me, <coughs> acoustic signals from our marine renewable energy devices, we do that by comparing them with baseline information. So we can do that two ways. We can do it at the same site as, or a different time. Uh, so that would represent our pre and post deployment survey. Or we could do it at a different site, but at roughly the same time. So that would represent your test and control site. But it's crucial that if you're going to do that, then the conditions need to be comparable in terms of how they're used, in terms of vessel activity, in terms of the depth and the general conditions. Um, it's not so valuable to measure at one site during a flat calm still day compared to the reference site during unsettled conditions because it's not very comparable. So I'll show some examples of some results that we had. So uh, this is uh, recordings from a tidal energy converter and it's showing the sound pressure level uh, on the side there. And the three lines correspond to three days of uh, recordings, each during uh, the ebb tide. So it's that comparable conditions I've mentioned. Uh, the pink line at the bottom is the reference site, uh, which is further away from the device. Uh, the green line represents uh, no generation. Um, so the device wasn't operating at that time. And then finally, the blue line at the top represents the device operating at 25% of its rated capacity. And the blue dotted line, or the dotted lines in between each of these uh, values here is the sort of the interquartile range, the 75 and 25% of the recordings. So what you can see here is that below around uh, 1000 hertz, there is elevated sound levels particularly from the device as it was generating at 25% rated capacity. And when we put these results into context of uh, species hearing ranges, we can see that the device sound may be detectable by several marine species, including uh, dolphins and porpoises. However, this may allow the device uh, or the noise from the device to act as a cue for animals to evade it and avoid a potential collision event which could be more detrimental to the animal. However, what the industry is yet to understand is in terms of these small scale effects, how does that uh, impact on the long-term habitat exclusion or barrier effects, which means the av complete avoidance of a, a tidal resource or marine renewable energy resource site by the animal? And how does that have consequences, uh, consequences excuse me, at a population level, what are the energetic impacts on these species? So these are all questions that need to be answered as we scale up to array scale. By comparison, we have some data from a wave energy converter. Um, this was a five day continuous recording at two locations which were equidistant from the wave energy device. And the way it was sampled was we had four different periods of uh, varying wave height and direction. So periods one to three, it was a, a lower significant wave height. So a reduced sea state versus period four, which was much more elevated, um, higher wave heights. And you can see again on the right, we've got uh, sound pressure levels uh, demonstrating that during increased sea state during period four, there was elevated sound levels by around 10 to 15 decibels above other periods. And when we looked at the spectrograms of both locations versus period two, which represented the lower sea state and period four, which was the, the higher wave conditions, 
what we can sort of see is there's a potential tonal signal at around 100 hertz uh, during period two, more present at location one, but still sort of there at location two, whereas it's harder to pick out in period four due to the uh, higher wave heights and increased broadband noise. So it's not possible at this stage to be able to attribute that potential tonal signal to the wave energy converter. Unfortunately for this uh, survey, we, we were limited by the lack of baseline data. So we didn't have the natural soundscape to compare that with. And lastly, I'll give a, a quick summary of the Sea Wave project, which were ran a couple of years ago at uh, our wave test site. Uh, we had some ambient noise surveys conducted by the Universities of Exeter and Plymouth. And these involved two week fixed hydrophone deployments during the summers of 2019, uh, 2020 and 21. Uh, this involved measurements at the Billiard Crew Wave test site and a northern reference site nearby with comparable conditions. And the key thing to note is that during these recording periods, there was minimal operational activity on site throughout those years. Uh, an example of some of the data comparing uh, the Billy Crew site with the North reference site, we first have long term spectral averages, which is looking at the data over uh, about 12 and a half days across each of the years and sites. And what we can see is that uh, the ambient soundscape of Billy Crew, it was more uh, influenced by episodic uh, loud amplitude events at lower frequencies, which may be due to something like vessel activity. Um, and that's showing more variation in sound pressure levels. There's less of this variation seen in the North reference site. And when we look at it uh, with frequency along the x-axis, we can see that comparing Billy Crew versus the North reference site, there's less variation um, between those two. And it might be because at this particular time, there's minimal operations and maintenance activity happening at Billy Crew, but what we can see is that around 5,000 uh, 5, hertz at Billy Crew, there is a persistent uh, elevated signature, and this could be due to the presence of mechanical or electrical infrastructure on site. So I'm going to uh, talk now about collision risk and how we can use INCO6 to inform it. So collision risk essentially means the physical contact of an animal with a rotational device. Um, it is a concern for the tidal sector more than wave because the tidal sector is dealing with um, more moving parts, the uh, rotational uh, turbine rotors. So it's a key regulatory focus and this is for uh, several reasons. The first one is it is a it's technically very challenging to reliably capture uh, or observe an interaction of wildlife with a tidal device, um, let alone an actual collision event. So there is no evidence of collision events available yet. Um, and the data we're seeing suggests that animals are able to avoid devices, but again, it has only been a small number of devices that we have been able to uh, do this monitoring around. So all in all, that means we lack the empirical knowledge on these direct interactions, and that can lead us in, when we think about consenting to that highly precautionary regulatory approach and imposing consent conditions to minimise as much as possible the risk of collision. One thing we do when we are assessing potential impacts is to perform collision risk modelling. And this is a way that we can estimate the likelihood of uh, encounter or collision by a different species. The difference between encounter and collision is collision deals with the physical impact side. Uh, encounter means within one to five device lengths. So it tends to be commonly used in that regard. And if we look at the flowchart on the side there, we can see that at the start of the process, you've got your animal size parameters in terms of body length and width and turbine parameters that you're feeding into the model. You're also taking into account animal activity, um, particularly at rotor depth, feeding into the model to get uh, what's called your no avoidance collision rate or encounter rate. And this is the rate before you factor in a number of assumptions into the model. And this firstly includes uh, avoidance. So again, this is very behavioral oriented, or behaviorally orientated. 
and then factoring in assumptions around injury and mortality. And again, we have no empirical data on this whatsoever. So with that, the end process is to understand is this level of injury or mortality acceptable um, with regard to the, the population. So you can see highlighted in red there that we have a number of critical evidence gaps. And particularly these models are, are limited by having to put these assumptions in and they don't account for the uncertainty and variability around species behaviours, particularly at the start of the process where we're looking at animal activity. There have been some papers that have looked into this and they found that sort of these predictions of collision risk, they can be extremely sensitive to the assumptions around behavioural parameters. Um, and that can lead to a highly conservative ass assessment, but overestimation of collision risk. So the key thing that we are needing here is robust fine scale data, particularly in species behaviours, to validate these model predictions. So the one way that we're wanting to uh, develop in this capacity is uh, in terms of in situ monitoring, is look at integrated sensor platforms and be able to gather this in situ data to inform our predictions. So we are working on a project just now that is looking to incorporate a multi-beam imaging sonar which uses active acoustic technology to detect objects in the water column and apply it to try and detect fine scale interactions around turbine rotors. But because we're working with uh, a new, we're working on a new uh, site and we've not got existing data sets to sort of validate these uh, uh, acoustic detections essentially want to be able to ground truth what it is we're picking up from the multi-beam sonar and to do this we would visually observe using subsea cameras um, that will allow us to uh, identify okay was that a species or was that a bit of detritus uh, it could be non non-living um, material and then be able to identify what species it is if it something is picked up and it is biological target so this is an example on the side there um, from the University of Washington. The sort of uh, fan diagram is the, the field of view from the multi-beam sonar itself. And while we've got some detections at the bottom, it, you can really pick it out with the underwater camera, what exactly it is. So in terms of planning a design concept to allow us to achieve this, um, we started by engaging with uh, Scotland's nature conservation body Nature Scott um, to align on regulatory concerns and requirements. So at the top there is an example, the key area of focus for collision risk is the rotor swept area of the turbine as that's where the, the biggest uh, concern is related to that. And then we looked at previous integrated monitoring platforms doing literature reviews, understanding um, what sensors were used in terms of the, the, the limitations they may have experienced and lessons learned in terms of development and the operation of these platforms. And through those lessons learned, our proposed solution was built from um, making sure that we had this ease of access and handling by personnel and that would reduce the operational complexity. And our goal is to have uh, a, a multi-beam sonar and camera system that is developed uh, in an iterative manner, which will allow us to achieve better long-term reliability. So instead of trying to build everything at once, we are sort of testing each hardware component as we go along, testing the process for software and data, uh, data processing and then factoring in things that will help it perform better long term in water, such as biofouling uh, management and making sure the sensors are not gunked up by algae and growth uh, over, over time. Lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the forward look and some of the lessons and challenges and summarise. Um, so first and foremost, when we talk about the IC-40, uh, one of the, the crucial things that EMEC does is we're a test centre, so we're continually learning from our technical operational ex expertise, and we want to share that to help progress uh, the sector and particularly standards development. So every time we're doing acoustic surveys, it's giving us opportunity to build feedback on uh, to the IEC-40 methods, and that will help um, contribute to uh, future iterations of the, the, the document. 
and also uh, we, we, we are focused on collaborating as well to improve testing consistency. Um, so, for example, we were involved in a project with other test centres looking at our methods for acoustic testing and where can we align going forward. There's still some areas where we need better or we need more international consensus to be reached on uh, some acoustic challenges. So I mentioned earlier about the flow noise contamination. There's no standard guidance yet for identifying flow noise in your data or uh, fixed mitigation um, while I it's out at survey. So for example, there are different materials that have been tested for uh, preventing flow noise, but it's not been completely eliminated. There's no one standard material that would be suggested just yet. And then secondly, I mentioned earlier that uh, the way we identify uh, currently marine renewable device noises, we're comparing it with ambient noise data sets. But what we lack is an objective method to actually differentiate this device noise. Right now, it's very comparative based and you may get different um, results depending on who's comparing the data set. So that's something that needs to be developed going forward. And lastly, I've mentioned a couple of times in terms of the operational challenges, EMEC is a test site that's working in these dynamic environments and safety is priority. So because we're working in these environments, there's, there's still challenges that remain and need to be considered when developing new standards, particularly for um, characterizing uh, noise around green renewable energy devices. For example, uh, scheduling is a key one. So trying to isolate the uh, vessel availability, your weather window for surveys or deployments, as well as if you're working in a, a survey that's tidally sensitive, aligning those three aspects alone can be very challenging and particularly through winter as well, especially on Orkney, the weather is quite dreadful over winter. So you are very limited in your available uh, ability to get out onto the water and collect data. So we lack that seasonal information that could be very valuable and better understanding how devices, uh, the noise is generated or even masked by the surrounding environmental conditions in that time. And lastly, when you're out in the water, the biggest consideration is your equipment performance. So uh, again, harsh environments, how are you going to make sure that the, the data is reliably collected, whether it's transmitted, things like that. So again, it's a case of planning, but also planning for failure as well, making sure that there's a sufficient redundancy depending on the system that you're using. And I think that is me for today. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, and before I hand back to Ben, I'd just like to uh, say I'm very happy to take any questions um, for the rest of the session. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for that. This is where we'd all be applauding if we're all here together in the same room. Uh, so as mentioned, yeah, we'll be taking some questions here. I think if you just um, click on the Q&A tab, you can should be able to type in questions there and then we'll relay them to Catherine. Um, but while that gets going, I just had a few to kind of start off with. Um, with the static deployments. I was wondering what kind of um, um, term length they have. Like what, what, how, how long do they tend to uh, be out there? Is it very much between different deployments? It's a good question. It depends on the equipment and it depends on, uh, again, conditions as well and when you can get out to retrieve the equipment. So breaking that down, if you have a battery operated system, um, then you are limited to the, the battery length. You can extend the, the, the life of that equipment and the longevity of, sort of the number of days recording by duty cycling. So instead of having continuous recordings, putting on the duty cycling. But again, that will only get you so far if you put the it into the water for so long and then suddenly conditions change and you can't get out to the water. It is a big consideration. So. For example, a, a general consideration we've had, we've been doing, um, looking at acoustic data sets that have been for about a week, two weeks maximum. Um, generally, they're shorter term. We are interested in looking at um, how we can uh, measure and process longer term data sets over perhaps a couple of months. 
that's still very much early in the process. Um, so I, I was I was wondering for the for the um, turbines. Um, do you notice any kind of difference in the um, acoustic signature over time? Like, it could you potentially tell the difference between a, a completely new one and one that's been there for a, a number of years or however long? That's really interesting. So I'm not aware of any sort of data sets or information within EMEC that have been able to do that, but I'm aware that I think I did meet with um, a group from University of Bath that had been looking into condition monitoring using acoustics. And I, again, it's not so much my field of specialty. I couldn't say much more than that, but I think it is a possibility, um, which I find really interesting. Absolutely. Um, also, I was also going to ask just before we do pass it over to everyone else. Um, so for the uh, deployments that you have, I, I suppose for the, the moving ones, you kind of, you're out there with them and you pick them up and then redeploy them as needed. So for the static ones, however, um, are you reliant on having to go out there and pick them up in order to collect the data or is there uh, an, a way to transmit it? So there's two ways. Um, so what we would do normally for our acoustic characterizations, because they, they are shorter term, I mentioned that we did five days continuous recording. So it's kind of a quick turn around, drop off and pick up over a few mm -hmm. days. Um, so normally that's battery operated. It is possible to do cable deployments. Um, that is a riskier situation in the sense that you've got uh, almost a single point of failure if you do lose a data feed. And again, it's, it's a bit of a trade-off because it's the same issue with battery operated deployments. You're not, until you recover the data, you can't tell if your sensor has you know, performed or not. So it is a bit of a trade-off. Um, I think for, for our acoustic work currently, we're more reliant on sort of the shorter term battery operated deployments. Um, these long-term cable deployments, there's a lot more sort of engineering and mechanical engineering work that needs to be uh, factored in to, to achieve this kind of goal. Whereas the environmental team at EMEC, we, we are able to kind of work with our marine ops team to quickly get our acoustic sensors into the water and back out using the battery operated deployments. So it is more convenient for us at this point in time. Sure. Okay, I'll stop hogging the Q&A session all to myself. Um, we have some questions coming in here. First one. Um, great talk. My question is related to fixed moorings. What methods can be used to reduce self-recorder noise from a mooring chain? That's a really good question. It's a really important one as well. Um, there are a, com a couple of things you can do. So um, the first thing is reducing as much as possible metal to metal contact. Um, and you can do this by perhaps um, increasing the, the amount of um, sort of the ropes that you're using. There is a way that you can pot joints, uh, I'm not sure if it's polyurethane or sort of coating them in a material so that they're sort of rubberized, present, uh, preventing that. Um, so there are sort of DIY methods, so to speak, to reduce that. Um, and again, when we look at the IEC 40, it's the same kind of idea. Their guidance is quite high level, just saying these are the ways that you can reduce um, self noise um, as far as possible. But eliminating it, it can be quite difficult, especially in strong conditions as well. Um, you, there's situations where, for example, if we are doing a fixed mooring, we do need to have clump chains and keep it, you know, firmly on the seabed and keep the the recovery buoy firmly in place. So, it is is a difficult one, but that's a good question. And that question, by the way, that was from uh, Emma Cavini. Uh, apologies if I am mispronouncing that name. The next one from Tim Mason. Um, can you give us any examples of materials you have used to reduce flow noise that have been affected? So the one that we've used is, um, again, it depends on where you're deploying and the system you're using. So for example, we had used a fixed system that used um, 10 pore per inch foam, 
which means that the the pores were large enough to sort of capture space around the pressure sensitive element of the hydrophone so it was, it was effective in that way and again that is one of the materials that actually is mentioned in the IC-40 specification. In terms of a uh, flow shield material that we're looking to use but haven't used um, we are looking at a sort of spandex blend material for our flow shield, uh, for the, the dart that I mentioned earlier on in the talk. Um, and the, the reason is that we need to make sure that sound can still pass through. It doesn't completely eliminate sound from the, the hydrophone, but it's preventing, um, it's, it's entrapping the hydrophone in sort of calmer, less turbulent space. But also the, we need to make sure that we're reducing as much as possible bubble formation on the surface of the uh, material because that in itself can affect the recording. So I don't have one specific material yet that I could definitely recommend. I've also um, been told on in passing that someone tried woolly hats and that that worked well. I thought that was quite quite amusing in a pinch, but yeah. Um, and the next question from uh, Stephen Comerford is to establish baseline conditions, you mentioned uh, same site, different time and different site, same time. Uh, are either of those preferable? I think, I think for here in Orkney, it, it depends on what's possible at the time. So same site, different, uh, same site, different time. I think probably would be preferable because it is your true pre and post deployment conditions and then it's it is the same site so you you're confident that your ambient conditions are reflective of what what the site is however it may not always be possible to get a, a same a pre and post deployment uh, measurements very close together um, some of these devices are in the water for a long time and we don't have uh, times when there's absolutely nothing on site that we get a completely uh, deviceless um, situation. The other thing, again, as I mentioned, is in terms of uh, scheduling for these kind of marine operations, sometimes it's a bit tricky to sort of align you know, your vessel availability, your uh, weather windows and the tidal conditions. So there, there definitely is an element of being flexible as well. But uh, yeah, I think probably, Stephen, same site, different time would probably be, be preferable in the long run. I, I think that is everything and that's all we uh, have time for today. But thank you very much to Catherine. Um, for the, the fantastic presentation. As mentioned, this was recorded, so this will be up on uh, YouTube at some point soon. Um, and thank you to everyone for uh, attending the webinar as well. Thanks. Bye. Thanks very much, Ben. Thank you, everyone.